Good morning, everybody. We are starting. We're going to give people a chance to uh, join the live before we start. Good morning to everybody who's already here. Can you guys let me know if you can hear me okay? All right, so it's 10 o'clock, so I'm just going to get started. I'm going to open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time right now. We thank you, Lord God, just for you providing a way for us to still be able to meet, Lord God, to gather in the middle of all of this that's happening, Lord God, and I pray, Lord God, for all of your churches around the world who are doing the exact same thing, Lord God, who are meeting over live stream, Lord God, who are adjusting, Lord, to just this new way of doing church, this new way of gathering, Lord God, in a time of a pandemic. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord God, just for all the people who are, who are giving words today, Lord God, at our church and others, that you would just give seed to the sower, Lord God, that you would give grace to the hearer, Heavenly Father, and that you would just reap the harvest, Lord God, and that you would get the glory, Heavenly Father, just from all of the words going out today, Lord God, from all of the people, Heavenly Father, who will be affected by your word, Lord God. We know that proximity doesn't matter in your kingdom, Lord God, that your word goes out, Lord, and it does not return void. So I just pray, Lord God, that you would give me grace, that you would speak through me, Lord God, that you would just use me, Heavenly Father, to, to teach, that you would give me wisdom, Lord God, and understanding, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so obviously this is new for us. This is something that nobody's used to. Um, I wasn't expecting to do, I was expecting to do this at church, not over Facebook, but again, here we are. Uh, this is the new normal, as we've all been saying for the last few weeks. And um, at the last few Bible studies, Pastor Oz has been teaching on uh, on God fulfill on Jesus fulfilling you know, the different sort of prophecies that were made about him throughout the, the beginning of Scripture. Uh, and last week he spoke on Isaiah 53, and we looked at how Jesus was a man who, who suffered many things. In the time that we're in right now, it's important for us to get a proper view of suffering and, you know, what it means to suffer well. You know, when I was preparing this message, something that kept coming up was why do good things or why do bad things rather happen to good people and it's a tough question it's a question that i don't feel like i'm fully adequate 
to be able to answer, but I think I, I do want to attempt to kind of scratch the surface of it. And uh, to do that, I want to look at three different portions of scripture. Um, the first one starting off in Genesis 29, 15 to 24. This is Joseph, or not Joseph, this is Jacob, after he um, basically stole Esau's blessing, he tricked his dad into praying for him, giving him the older son's blessing, and his mom, Rebecca, said, all right, listen, I fear that your brother might try to do something bad to you, so what I'm going to do, I want you to go to my brother's house, go to Laban, and Jacob goes, he runs away, and as soon as he gets to Laban's house, he sees Rachel, and he immediately falls in love with Rachel, and so... He tells Laban, listen, I will work for you for seven years if you give me Rachel's hand in marriage. And Laban goes, all right, you've worked for me this, this years and you are my kin. It doesn't, it's not fair for you to do all this work and to not receive anything. So if that's what you want. I will let you marry my daughter. And as we all know, Laban pulls the old switcheroo. And instead of giving him Rachel, he gives him Leah. And Jacob obviously was not pleased with this. So starting in, uh, starting in verse 15, Genesis 29. Then Laban said to Jacob, because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me what should your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, and Laban said, It is better that I give you it's better that I give her to you than I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, or my days for my days are fulfilled, then I may go to her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the, pay, of the place and made a feast. Now it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob. And he went into her. So now this is after Jacob had just spent seven years of his life toiling away, working. Uh, Laban makes it clear that those seven years, that while he was there, he wasn't working for a wage, which is why he gave him he made the offer to give Rachel to him. But Laban later on says, why would I give you my younger daughter when that's not our custom? Our custom is to marry off the oldest daughter first. Obviously, this is not this wasn't their plan. This wasn't the deal. This isn't what Jacob has signed up for. This is what this isn't what Jacob was expecting to happen. So now Jacob has essentially wasted, well, not wasted seven years, but he spent seven years of his life working towards something that never came to fruition. He spent seven years of his life hoping for something, wishing for something, thinking that something was going to happen that never came. And then what he got instead, he was not happy with. He was upset with. So I think my, the first point I want to get to here is there's two things in this chapter in these verses is when you look at Jacob's life he spent seven years working for Rachel ended up getting Leah he spent another seven years after that to finally get Rachel and then the scripture says that he spent another seven years after that so he used a, a total of 21 years of his life working for Laban, who essentially used him, who deceived him, who did pretty much everything in the book to mistreat him. You know what I mean? And, but in the middle of all of that, you know, in the middle of all of that, Jacob was, he was faithful to God. You know what I mean? He, he never, he was faithful to God. And this is interesting because at the start, you know, I, I, why do bad things happen to good people. Jacob, by most standards, he wasn't a bad guy, but he wasn't a good guy. This is a guy who was essentially on the run from his brother because he lied to his father. He lied on God 
to his father saying that God blessed him when he didn't. Uh, so, you know, you hear all, all the time about people saying, well, you know, the deceiver was deceived when talking about Jacob, but they rarely ever, I rarely ever hear this verse preached when it comes to suffering. And there's two things that happened in the 21 years that Jacob was in Laban's house. One, God was able to work through all the mess. He worked through all the deception and the jealousy and the competition between Rachel and Leah and God began to fulfill the promise he made to Abraham through Jacob while he was in the middle of this. Jacob's sons that he had with Rachel and Leah and their two maids, their two, their two servants, um, they would become the fathers of the 12 tribes of Israel. And second, even though Jacob didn't want to be where he was, because he stayed in the suffering, because he stayed in it, he actually left better than how he came. So what that says is don't assume that the situation you're in that's causing you to suffer or causing you stress is not for your own good. God needed to show Jacob uh, about himself in that situation, and he needed to get Jacob to a place where he could trust God. And obviously, if we look at everything that's happening right now, the reason why we're doing church over a live stream is because... Obviously, we're all on lockdown. We are in the middle of a pandemic crisis with COVID-19. This is something that is causing a lot of people stress. This is something that's causing a lot of people suffering, whether it's physical, whether it's financial, whether it's having to deal with the struggles of being isolated and separated from friends and family right now, or getting bad reports about friends and family who have gotten COVID. You know, and, and we just see how God is right now. God has us all in a place where we have to look at ourselves, that we can be introspective and we can look to him. And he's put us in the place right now where we have to trust God, where we have to be willing to trust God with everything right now. Um, you know, when Jacob was at Laban's house, it was actually there that Jacob had in his first encounter, his first real encounter with God, where he wrestled God and he said, God, like, I'm not, he said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. He held on to him and he said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Now, if Jacob had have been anywhere else, would God have shown up the way he did? If Jacob had refused pretty much to let God work out, what God wanted to work out in him while he was where he was, would things have turned out the way they were, the way they did? You know, he wrestled with God. And it was while Jacob was in the middle of this circumstance that God blessed him. You know, like Jacob, when Jacob got to Laban's house, when Jacob entered into the suffering, he had nothing. He was a man on the run. He was a man who was fleeing death from his brother. He was a man who, who was... Really, you know, by all by all standards, he wasn't the most upfront person. But when he left, God blessed him. In Genesis thirty one eleven, God actually assures Jacob. He said, you know, he tells Jacob, "I was I've been watching, I've been seeing how Laban treated you. I've been watching what you're going through." And what that just what that says for us is that God is not far from our suffering. He's in the middle of it. He's working things out even when we're not aware of what he's doing yet. I mean, I see a lot of people on social media and they're freaking out. A lot of people, they, they are, they're freaking out. A lot of people don't know what's happening right now. And to me, people are missing, they're missing the excitement of this time. They're missing the beauty of this time. We've never had a time like this across the three generations that we've been talking about at church where the whole world has basically shut down and we don't know what God's doing right now. We don't know what he's working out. But I mean, in my life personally, I've seen God open up so many doors and just in talking to different people, I've seen God opening up so many doors that you think wouldn't be open right now just because of the situation that we're in. So now I want to jump to 
uh, the next portion of scripture, which is Genesis 45, 4 and 8. And this is one of Jacob's sons. This is Joseph. We want to look at the life of Joseph. Just the, the end of the end of the story. So give me a second to turn there. And again, I'm not going to spend too much time going over Joseph's life. Um, because I feel like most of us, we know Joseph's story. Uh, just to go over real quick. He was pretty much the favorite son of his father. He started having these prophetic dreams at a young age that his brothers were going to bow down to him and worship him and serve him. His brothers didn't like that, so they faked his death. Joseph ends up getting sold into slavery. While he's in slavery in Egypt, he actually gets leveled up to a pretty high position. And then from there, he goes to jail, loses everything that he had gained, and then he levels up to an even higher position than that. So in, jo in uh, Genesis, now in Genesis 45, 4, well, before this, you know, Joseph, he basically tells Pharaoh, like, he interprets some dreams of Pharaoh, and he says, look, there's going to be a famine in the land. There's going to be a time that's going to come. It's going to be a seven-year famine. It's going to be bad. And that time actually comes, and Joseph's brothers, they come to him. They come to buy grain. They don't recognize this Joseph because at this point, Joseph has been essentially assimilated uh, culturally, not so much spiritually, into the Egyptian way of life. But when Joseph sees them, he recognizes them as his brothers. And instead of him taking revenge on them or, or repaying them for their actions, what he does is something far greater. So let's look at verse 4 of chapter 45. Uh, it says that Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do you not. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to, to preserve life. So. I didn't want to do this as like a traditional three point sermon, but I guess like if that, if there was a, a second point to be made, the first point would be don't assume that God is away from our suffering. The second point here is don't assume that your suffering has anything. Sometimes your suffering may not have anything to do with you. Sometimes you can be suffering something so other people can be blessed. And verse five here, it says, but now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Joseph didn't do anything to deserve what his brothers did to him. But because he was sure of his calling. And there's going to be people in your life that don't understand the call of God on your life. They don't, they're, they're not going to understand what God is doing in your life. And we see that just in the persecution that we face as Christians. Um, around the world, Christians are being persecuted because people don't understand the gospel. They don't understand what God is doing through us. They don't understand who God is and how much he cares for us and the transformation that's happened in our lives. And that can cause tension in relationships, which is what happened between Joseph and his brothers. Now, Joseph, Joseph's whole life was changed because of the actions of the people around him. And he didn't know what was happening to him. He didn't know why this was happening to him. He was a little kid. He didn't know why he was being sold into slavery. He didn't understand why his brothers would push him into a ditch and fake his death. He had no idea. But God was with him. And the same way that, jo that Jacob had to be put in a situation that was uncomfortable, that was different, that was new. That was strange. Joseph was in a strange place. He was unfamiliar with Egypt and their customs. But it was there that God blessed him and elevated him. But it was also in that place where he would experience multiple betrayals. He would have accusations made against him. And for all his gifts and abilities, he would have to sit in jail and, and be patient until when his gifts could be used.
you know, but um, but after all this, when when he saw his bro- his brothers, he actually had mercy on them. Why? Why would he have mercy on the people who who did such horrible things to him? And it's because when he saw his brothers, he realized he realized that a he missed them more than he hated them. He he his love for them trumped his all the bad feelings that he could have had for them and two he realized that had he not gone through what he went through to get to where he was thousands of people would have died because they wouldn't have been prepared for a famine like and that's that's amazing and this is what i'm saying sometimes the things that we're suffering through they may not always be for us. Everything that Joseph went through, everything that he had to go through is because God needed him in a position to where he would save thousands of lives. Had Jacob not been sent to jail, had Jacob not been sold into slavery, had Potiphar's wife not accused him of raping her and him being sent to jail, he never would have been able to to tell Pharaoh, look, there's going to be a famine coming. We need to set it. We need to do something. We need to take some measures. We need to set aside food. We need to do something now. Otherwise, no one's going to survive this. So had not, so had he not gone there, God never would have been able to use him. Had Jake, had Joseph, you know, decided, no, I'm, I'm going to leave Egypt. I'm going to, I'm going to find my way back to a place where I feel comfortable. I'm going to find my way back to a place where I want to be. So many lives would have been lost. You know, and then just look at verses seven through eight. And God sent me before. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you and the earth to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh. He's made me a counselor to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Again, Joseph is saying, it wasn't you guys who sent me here. You may have, you may have done it. It may have been by your hands that it happened, but it was by God's will that it happened. God allowed this not only so I could help save a thousand thousands of people from starving, but so your lives would be spared. God used Joseph to deliver the same people who tried to kill him, who faked his death, who sold him into slavery, who got him in this situation to begin with. Once Joseph understood that this was a sovereign move of God, that allowed him to not look at his suffering and go, what would have been different about my life had I not suffered all these things? What would have been different about my life had I not gone through this? Why am I here? Why is this happening to me? And instead, Joseph understood, and that allowed him to truly forgive his family, to show grace to people who hated him, who did him wrong. These are the same people who dumped him in a ditch and they faked his death and God was using him to deliver these same people. And just a side note, I'm pretty sure we all have people in our lives that feel like thorns in our sides and God is saying, love them. God is saying, suffer through that person because they need you. That's off topic, but you know. And so, you know, and, and, but to get back on topic, God couldn't allow the sons of Jacob to die because again, he needed them to populate what would become the 12 nations of Israel, including Judah, whose bloodline directly leads to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. From Jacob to Joseph, God was already setting in motion redemptive history and I don't know if you've caught on to this yet but the the path that's being taken here the pattern that's being set up is that 
sometimes blessing comes through suffering sometimes redemption comes through suffering and we'll see that with the last section of scripture because again with Judah being the direct bloodline that Jesus will come through I want to look and I want to close this looking at the end of Jesus's life because if we're going to talk about suffering like Pastor Oz was talking about last week with Isaiah 53 if we're going to talk about suffering we need to look at Jesus who suffered the most who suffered more than most of us could imagine he didn't just suffer a criminal's death on a cross he suffered a sinner's death in taking the punishment for our sin that he didn't deserve it was it was a much different kind of suffering because it was a suffering that by all by all accounts he shouldn't have had to endure much like Joseph but that's the difference between Jesus and us so you know unlike unlike Jacob who essentially brought his suffering on himself and Joseph whose suffering was not his own fault and you know he he really had he really had no choice in it he could do nothing to stop it cuz i mean he was overpowered and it just it happened the way that it happened and when Joseph was walking around in his fancy coat telling everyone who would listen that one day you're all going to bow to me, you're all going to serve me. I, I don't think that Joseph would have been as excited to get to that point if his father told him, you know, well, son, yeah, that's true. But first, you have to spend years in jail. Everything you earn is going to you're going to lose. And. People are going to tell lies about you. And for a few years, you're going to basically be forgotten. I don't think Jake, I don't think Joseph would have been as excited about that. Which is what sets Jesus apart. Because Jesus chose his suffering. Jacob's suffering was a consequence of his own actions. Because God needed to chip away at the outside and the inside of Jacob and to work things out in Jacob. Joseph's suffering was the actions of other people who didn't quite understand what Jacob what Joseph where Joseph was coming from. Joseph needed to go through what he went through because God needed him to. And that's the same thing with Jesus. Jesus suffered because it was part of God's plan, God the Father's plan to have Jesus suffer and to die for our redemption now and Jesus chose to suffer he knew what it was for he knew who it was for he endured it for the joy that was set before him unlike Joseph like I said I don't think if Joseph knew what he had to go through to get to where he was going I don't think Joseph would have stuck through it but Jesus he chose it he chose his suffering Jesus left heaven he left glory and he came down here to put on f human flesh and to eventually be led to the cross so now I want to turn to Matthew 26 verse 36 and uh, this is where I'm going to close at Or did I say, tw yeah, Matthew 26, 36. This is uh, Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Jesus, I know people like to 
like to make it seem like Jesus didn't feel the weight of what was happening. I mean, obviously, if you we know Jesus felt what was happening to him. Jesus knew. It, it says that he was so stressed about what was happening to him that he started sweating blood. You know, and like Jesus wasn't. He was fully man and fully God, so Jesus was fully aware of what was going to happen to him. And in a spiritual sense, Jesus knew that him, that he who knew no sin would have to become sin so that you and I could be set free from the effects of sin. That in order to set us free, he, he had to take the wrath that was coming. And I think that was... That for him that was worse than having to die a physical death. You know, but our our suffering it can make us so self centered. It can make us be so suffering has a way of, of us looking at ourselves and just going, Well, why? 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 How did I get here? What happened? Why is this happening to me? Why would they do this to me? Why would they why why is God allowing this to happen to me? But again, if we look at Jesus and we go to verse 39 and verse 42, we see that twice Jesus goes, if there's another way for, if there's another option, let's go for that option. If there's another way around this, can we, can we do that? But in verse 39, he says, he went a little, he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed saying, Oh, my father. If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, not what I want, but as you will. Not how I want this to happen. I don't particularly want to suffer. No one particularly wants to suffer. But if this is the, if this is the road that I have to go down to get where you need me to go, then let your will be done. And in verse 32, he says it again, again, a second time, he went away praying, saying, Oh, my father, this cup cannot pass from me unless I drink it, then your will be done. That is such a different attitude of suffering than most people have, than I have, than you have, than, uh, than most Christians around the world have, especially Christians here in, in America. We don't like suffering. We don't like doing things that are hard. We don't like anything that takes us out of our comfort zone. We don't like doing anything that's going to cause us to not be able to do what we want and live the lives that we want. But Jesus says, listen, if I have to go to that cross, if I have to be cursed to hang on that tree, if I have to die, take their sins so that they could love you, so that they could know you, so that they could be reconciled to you, then not my will be done, but your will be done. Like how how different and I'm going to close here. Uh, how different would we approach life if every time we had to endure something hard for a season, we didn't look at God and ask, Lord, why me? But instead, if we looked at these three different accounts of suffering and we looked at how Jesus suffered and we said, not why me, but for who? Who am I suffering for? Why am I suffering for this person? It would change that little perspective shift can change so much. It can change how much we're willing to endure, how far we're willing to go to the suffering and into a period of suffering and see it through to the end and let God bless us. God is not going to bring us through a period of suffering and then not have something come out of it at the end. Romans 8 28 says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Jacob, Joseph, and then Jesus. It's the same family line. It's the same bloodline. They all suffered for the redemptive purposes of God's plan. To preserve and, and to reconcile men back to the Father. And that's what we are called to do. We are called to endure suffering for a season. Whether it's so God can work something out in us. So that we can be better equipped to help someone else. Or God is calling us to suffer. Not because it has anything to do with us. But because our suffering, our faithfulness in the suffering can be a light and a testimony to someone else who needs to see 
how Jesus moves in hard situations and that God wants to bless us and they can be blessed by watching how we go through suffering, how we deal with COVID-19, how we continue to keep our food pantry open, how we continue to love people, how we continue to gather, how the church continues to unite in the situation. The way the church is handling the situation should be a light and a testimony to the rest of the world who's like, who's literally losing their minds right now because they don't know what's happening. You know what I mean? God is using us in this right now. He's calling us right now to rise up, to intercede, to pray, to love people more than we've ever loved them before, to like really, to, to love the people who persecute us, to pray for our enemies right now. This is a time in history like none other, at least not that we've been able to experience. And God is really trying to say something to us. God is really trying to tell his church to wake up. God is really trying to tell his church to not look at suffering, not look at the way that the world is going and miss what God is doing, to miss what God is trying to show you, to miss how much God wants to bless us all when this is done with. But right now, that blessing is only going to come while in the middle of it, you're trusting him. While in the middle of this, you're obedient. While in the middle of this, you're not binging Netflix. While in the middle of this, that you're seeking his face and that you are trying to really tap into what God wants to show you and do with you through this. And so with that, I just want to, I want to close in prayer. Thank you for um, tuning in for watching the live thank you for joining us here uh this sunday again i know this was weird but this is probably how things are going to be for the foreseeable future um i don't know who's going to be doing the bible study next week but i can guarantee that they're also going to be uh, doing it over facebook live um so just uh Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word, Lord God. I thank you that as I was preparing it, Lord God, how much you blessed me through it, Heavenly Father. And I pray, Lord God, that those who heard it were blessed by it as well, Heavenly Father. And I, I just thank you, Lord God, for what you're doing in this time. I thank you, Lord God, that you've given us a blueprint on how to suffer well, Lord God, on how to have joy and peace in the middle, Lord God, of situations and circumstances that we don't understand, Lord God, that you are working, Heavenly Father, things out that we don't know, that you are doing things that we can't see, Heavenly Father, but it's all going to work out for our good, Lord God, that at the end of this, you are going to do something mighty and powerful, Lord God, for your kingdom, Heavenly Father, and you are going to get the praise, Lord God, and people are going to be set free, Heavenly Father, help your church, Lord God, to stand up in this time, Lord God, and to pray and to seek you, Lord God, to seek first your kingdom, Lord God, and to really, Heavenly Father, just extend ourselves, Lord God, to love each other. That as we've been called, Lord God, just to stay home, to self-quarantine, help us, Lord God, to just use this time, Heavenly Father, to, to reach out to you, to seek you, Lord God. This is an unprecedented, unprecedented time of rest. Lord God, that you have given us, Lord, to seek you. So help us, Lord God, to just all seek you, Lord God. Heavenly Father, we repent, Lord, for just our selfishness, for our self-focus, Lord God. We repent, Lord, for just missing what you were trying to say to us in this moment, Lord God. And I pray that going forward, we will have our eyes and our ears open, Lord God, to see and to hear you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, well, that is, uh, that's it for me. Thank you guys again for tuning in. The worship service will start at 11 o'clock, so this ended a little early, so you're going to have a break to, um, you know, do whatever you need to do, and then come back and for the 11 o'clock service to start. Thank you.